later. OK, so um, you know, the kind of theme of what I'm going to be talking about is how do we kind of bring together research, you know, psychologists doing research, education people doing research that they normally publish with actual practice? Um, how do we improve outcomes and learning for students? How do we help faculty teach better? And so my approach is really about trying to think, let's think about collaborative, let's rethink experimentation, be collaborative, dynamic, and personalized. I think this is the method that probably many of you can apply in your own problems. And so I'm originally from the Caribbean, from Trinidad and Tobago. And I tell everyone this before I talk, because they say that otherwise they miss the first 10 minutes trying to guess where I'm from. <laughs> so now that you know I'm from Trinidad, I guess I have your full attention. Cool. And so I'm a system professor in information systems analytics as of uh, two weeks ago. So, you know, we're all aware that digital resources are increasingly used in education. Whether it's online homework like Khan Academy or six months, a platform I work with, whether it's on-campus courses like Canvas or Ivy League, or whether it's MOOCs like Coursera and edX. But these resources don't always actually benefit learning. There, there are many studies that show that even content that looks good on first sight may not actually move the needle in terms of helping people. And I don't, to give you an example, of the kinds of problems I tackle. Imagine a professor teaching statistics, Joe. So he gives the students problems on edX or Ivy League, has them solve a problem, they type an answer. But he finds that they just don't seem to learn from these problems. They attempt them over and over without figuring out the key concepts or principles. And problems are actually pretty broad. In a context more relevant to people who do health behavior change, one area I've worked on is how do you help Samantha, clinical psychologist who's trying to get people to learn how to apply cognitive behavior therapy to coping with depression or improving their eating habits or quitting smoking. Well, she might give them scenarios that they have to think through and reflect on, like how do they change the interpretation of an event so that they can manage emotions and not give it to impulses like desiring to smoke or feeling depressed. And so again, she might find that you give people these resources, but it doesn't actually change the behavior. They don't quit smoking, they don't eat healthier. So how can we actually design resources that are going to move the needle in terms of getting people to acquire knowledge and apply it, and also again to change habits and behavior? And so I think that the fact that you've got this sense of big lack of measurable learning isn't that it resources or courses aren't well designed. People do a really thorough, extensive job. I think the challenge is that you really can't predict what works in the real world until you deploy it. And this is a classic theme in human computer interaction. You want to design something implement it, and then evaluate it. So in an ideal world, what I think we need is we need to actually build online resources, even something as boring as a math problem. We need to build it so that when we deploy it, we already know that we're going to have to keep improving it and testing it out. So ideally, instead of a static math problem or a lesson, we'd have systems that perpetually improve, like real teachers. If you think about it, when you're explaining to someone how to solve a problem, none of you come up with one explanation and say it to 1,000 people. Every time you see, speak to someone, you organically change how you explain it. And so what that means is that over time, you might figure out which explanations are better than others. So you're perpetually learning and improving. And you also figure out which explanations work for different people. Maybe one ex a simple explanation is good for low-knowledge students and a complex one for high-knowledge students, or, or the reverse. So how do we get systems that can actually test out and improve the way real teachers do? And my approach to this is ready to see that digital resources move us closer to this vision because they give us new opportunities to experiment. So when you take a student from solving problems on pen and paper to doing it online on a website that consists of Khan Academy, it's a very simple step. But actually, in some ways, it's revolutionary because it brings together a researcher's lab where you can do controlled randomized experiments, like different versions of problem, with a real-world classroom. These students are not solving problems because they're trying to participate in an experiment. They just want to learn so they can do better on their homework. And so I see technology as allowing us to do experiments that bridge research with practice. In particular, experiments are also a common language between teachers, social scientists, and, and reinforcement learning researchers. So teachers, I think, can understand concepts like which motivational message do you send someone an email that actually gets them to come back to class or changes their attitude. Social behavioral scientists do experiments like this all the time, often in a lab setting, where their goal is not to figure out directly how to help people, but to uncover some psychological mechanisms or understand the process by which people learn or think. And then finally, within statistics and machine learning, there's a huge set of algorithms that tackle what's called exploration versus exploitation. So in particular, reinforcement learning. When you're taking actions in the real world, how do you figure out which actions are good? 
So to be concrete, if you're giving people different math problems, how do you figure out which problems are actually helping them learn? And in particular, you could try all the math problems in the world, but you actually want to start using that data to improve outcomes. So a big part of reinforcement learning is figuring out how do we test our actions, and as soon as we figure out what's working, let's actually roll it out. So there are thousands of researchers doing this work at, at conferences like NIPS, AAA, and ICML, but they very rarely actually apply the algorithms to real-world settings. So they can actually use these algorithms to run dynamic experiments, where you can run an experiment and see what's working or what's working for who, analyze the data, and in real time make improvements. So I actually see this as a test bed for kind of bringing together teachers, social behavioral scientists, and machine learning researchers. So my approach to this then is, Every time I think of an experiment in education, you might think of alternative conditions and some outcome metric. And so to do this, I try and draw on my training in cognitive science, where in my PhD, I worked on questions like, what questions help you? How do you prompt people to explain a way that helps them learn? So that's kind of representing the, the agenda of cognitive scientists in trying to do experiments in the real world that answer basic science questions. I also try to bridge this with the interests of education researchers who might often actually want to ask an instructional design question. Which question is actually going to maximize learning? Now, to go beyond just doing experiments to actually improving a system, what I aim to do is dynamic analysis. So you might, in real time, after 10 students do a, a math problem or see an email, figure out, well, which condition seems to actually be increasing learning, success on future problems? And then let's actually, in real time, adjust so that even if the first 10 students are assigned 50-50, the next 10 or the next 20 might get assignment like 60-40 or 80-20. So over time, we're actually using experiments to enhance a system. This could lead eventually to enhancement where someone gets all the best condition, one, everyone gets a really good condition. But there's actually a myth, we're missing something if we just go for enhancement. What else would we want to do with these experiments if we really want to optimize? Well, in fact, some conditions might work well for different groups of people. So we also want to use experiments to discover how do we personalize. And if we build that infrastructure right, every experiment you run could actually be an engine for personalizing as you figure out which explanations, which messages work for different people. And so to do that, this is where I draw on Bayesian statistics and reinforcement learning. So in my PhD, I applied them to modeling cognition, but now I actually apply it to building these adaptive systems. Finally, if you truly want to perpetually improving systems, we can't just have a fixed number of conditions. We've actually got to build software so that we can keep adding new conditions. Every time you get a new idea or you learn something from data, how do we add another condition to test it out? And to do this, I draw on methods from human-computer interaction, in particular crowdsourcing, where you can actually have students and teachers help you design experiments, and human competition more generally. How do we actually bring together groups of people through technology so that they keep adding these new conditions and testing out new ideas? So to go from simple, you know, randomized assignment to this vision of dynamic analysis, personalization, continually adding conditions, most software just doesn't support it. Khan Academy, edX, Coursera, IVLE, almost anything you work with won't do this out of the box. So I've actually developed a, a software requirement specification, and I call it MOOClets because we've applied in MOOCs, but really it applies to anything. It applies to apps for health behavior change, sending emails to people, it applies on campus. But the kind of key idea is anytime you want to run an experiment where you assign people different conditions, or you just want to assign people different resources, like different problems, if you implement that in software using the MOOCLED specification, it basically guarantees that you've got the data structures and algorithms and APIs so that you can start off experimenting, but you can always transition to personalization, or you can add new conditions whenever you want. So given an overview so far, I started with this vision of perpetually improving systems. How can we make something as simple as a problem more like a real teacher? And I outlined my approach, which is to think about, let's rethink experimentation to be collaborative, dynamic, and personalized. So now I'm going to go through a bunch of different applications of this approach. And I think maybe as I go through, you can see how you, would you apply these kind of methods in your own work. So I'll give you two concrete examples of experiments just very quickly. I won't go into methods, just so you can think of something specific. And then I'll talk about the adaptive explanation improvement system, which is a system that actually would crowdsource explanations from learners and then run a dynamic experiment to test out which explanations were actually helpful. 
Then I'll go into a, a system I tested out at Harvard, and I'm, I'm now kind of porting over to IDLE, and we hope to deploy in a MOOC in about uh, two or three weeks. It actually lets instructors collaborate with researchers to design these experiments on different forms of feedback. I'll talk a bit on how we might look at discovering how to personalize, so I'll give you one illustration. Quickly touch on the MOOClet engine and API, just giving you a bit of a better sense of what that concept is and how it could be useful. I'll talk more generally about some resources for experiments that, especially um, if you have students or people who are trying to deploy out in the real world, they might find useful. Qualtrics is a, a software that actually is originally designed for surveys, but it allows a lot of flexibility. So you can actually build entire courses in Qualtrics. And it's one of the few softwares that's out of the box with some small changes. You can actually plug in MOOClets. So you can do dynamic experimentation by making calls out to APIs. You can allow people to collaboratively edit. I'll also mention Assistments, which is another platform that I've worked with in the US. It's originally for K-12 math, but they've actually got the ability to integrate with learning management systems, like here at NUS, as well as MOOCs. And Assistments is unique because it provides a lot of really um, interesting analytics for teachers, but it's still a very simple system. And they've actually found that teachers, you know, 50,000 teachers actually adopt it, which is rare for research projects. Sorry, um, teachers with over 50,000 students have actually adopted this. And Assistments is another setting where you can run these randomized experiments, and it's very customizable. And finally, I'll throw this idea of um, just point you to a, a resource or tutorial I have on Mechanical Turk, where a lot of these studies we're running um, with respect to field experiments, they're often very hard to get out in the real world. You have small samples, and it's very high stakes. So one approach that I'm using now is actually, even if I'm going to run something in a MOOC or an on-campus course, I first run it on Mechanical Turk. So you almost treat it like a lab study with a convenient sample. So you can test out the software. You can pilot it. But also, you can actually often do a more rigorous study, which makes it easier to publish it later on, and also convince stakeholders. And I'm just going to touch on some ongoing and next directions. And I think I'm going to throw these out now, because um, these might be areas that people are interested in collaborating on or would like to talk more about. So basically, one area that I'm interested in is thinking about how do we dynamically personalize motivational emails. So for example, on campus, how do we get students to come back to courses by sending them emails that are tailored to their particular attitudes? And in a MOOC in particular, this is a really important step for being able to send emails that will bring someone back to a course when they've dropped out. And especially thinking about people do things like MOOCs for so many different reasons. How do we tailor these? Another is actually thinking about personalized delivery of interventions that have been proven in social and cognitive psychology to work but often aren't integrated together and often aren't personalized. So to give a concrete example, um, incoming freshmen at NUS, could we actually deliver them with interventions that encourage them to adopt a growth mindset? The idea that intelligence is malleable. Or wise feedback, that when they get feedback, it's actually meant to promote their learning. And also self-explanation training, helping them understand that asking questions can actually um, is a strategy that enhances their long-term outcomes. So these are three things that I interest by accident. They've all been shown in randomized trials to actually be very powerful. Even just a couple hours can actually boost grades a month later. And so that's very promising. But we haven't actually seen how they work in, in a context like in Singapore. And we haven't also seen, there's also evidence that they work on their own. Growth mindset versus nothing is good. Wise feedback versus nothing is good. But how do you actually think about when should someone get a growth mindset intervention versus wise feedback? So that's kind of really stepping on how do we kind of start personalizing interventions. Another thing that I'm developing now is thinking about a web app that will help students set micro goals. So this is a nice setting where you can give students an app that will ask them to sort of set a goal for the next 24 hours, and then you follow up with different prompts for them to reflect. You know, what are the obstacles to the goal? What actions can they put in place to maximize the success? And each of these prompts I see as, a, as an avenue for dynamic experimentation. Because which prompts work for different people is likely to depend a lot on their current study habits and their attitudes. And finally, um, I'm very interested in how we can build things like web apps to help people use effective study strategies. So again, you've got a lot of evidence in psychology and education from these big interventions. Give someone a week of training or not, and it helps. But how do we now take a more user-centered design approach, where you might take elements of an intervention that um, ask, gets people to ask themselves questions while they're watching a lecture? Like, what are the lecture going to talk about next? How does this relate to what I already know? 
And how do we actually package that into an app that people can actually use so that they might pull it up while they're watching a video and it's going to give them questions in just the right moment and help them kind of um, incorporate more naturally into what they're already doing. So I kind of covered a lot there. Um, do people have any questions or thoughts or what, what aspect of this would be most interesting because I won't get to everything. Yeah, I think that's a great, great question. And that's a good research question. So I mean, I, I should say, I don't think I'm solving the problem, but I'm developing tools that will help you answer that. So for example, um, you might compare, what if you cue people to know that these emails are not really very personalized. They don't come, so here's one condition. Emails that come from the instructor, and it's signed by the instructor, so they really feel like it's coming from them. Versus emails that say, you know, ro um, what, we wouldn't say robot number 59, but you know, automated emailer. That's a really good question. Which of those is more likely to make people return to the class? And in fact, there's likely individual differences. Some people are totally fine with an automated message. Others are going to feel like it's just not on target for them. But I think that's a kind of very interesting question to look at. Sorry. Oh, yes. So I understand from this point of view, you're talking about the usage of personalization, right? But yeah. There's also another big view of personalization in terms of tailoring to specific user segments. So, yes. so I try I try to better understand in terms of scale and employability, right? Would using a segmentation strategy be better as compared to a more personalized approach? Because we would understand that if we use a personalized approach, there's going to be a lot of resources that's gonna be invested in trying to tailor to each individual. Yeah, so this is a this is a great question. And actually, I've, I've been very blurry in my use of personalization. So the, the point raised here is, when I say personalization, do I mean really tailoring to men, who is, has this huge effect of attributes? And, or do I mean tailoring to segments, people who are directors at all set, right? Or faculty versus non-faculty. In general, when I say personalization, I mean to segments. So that's, that, that's just my particular angle on it. And the reason I focus on that is because I think this is where randomized experiments are useful. You might discover that, on average, motivational emails work well for people who are faculty versus grad students, or grad students who like to work in the morning versus evening. And that allows you to kind of generalize. Whereas most of the approaches to personalize the individuals, they in involve really intensive domain models. So John Stamper's colleagues especially know a lot about this. You build essentially an AI model of how someone solves math, and you give them an exact piece of feedback. So that's interesting, and but it's not the particular angle I focus on here. And how is my speed? Like, am I going too fast? Right hand? Too slow? Okay. Okay. Good. Cool. Okay. So. Do you have any thoughts about uh, how instructors feel about personalization? Because sometimes, let's say the the system sends out an email and signed by the the faculty, and then the next day the student goes out. Oh, thanks for the motivational email. I really appreciate it, and the instructor's like, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, this is a great point. So, and yeah, so I think there, there are a bunch of interesting ideas there, but so let me latch on to one thing. One is whether, um, how do we bring instructors into the loop when we're running these studies? So instructors will not like to be surprised to find out we send these personalized emails out that suddenly they're on the hook for. Right? And so that's definitely an issue to think about. One thing I found works well is with this kind of co-design of experiments, like giving tools where instructors can actually design, then they're more aware of the design decisions and they feel more comfortable. And so let me actually, if you guys don't mind me jumping around a little bit. Oh, yeah, sure. So I'm just going back to that um, point about, you know, what, after the personalized email happens, what happens? Let's assume it's to a huge cohort, like the entire yes. university. Or and when there are students actually responding to it, and and then faculty or the admin administration actually don't follow up on that, yes. and that becomes a An bigger issue. issue. So how? What are your thoughts on that? Yes. Yeah, so I mean, maybe other people have thoughts on this as well because it's not something I've done research on. I welcome anyone to jump in. So so my thoughts are actually. 
I haven't actually focused so much on personalizing in the sense of crafting emails for individuals. I focus more on, I should already call it segmentation, in the sense of, um, let me see if I can actually, if you guys don't mind me jumping around a bit, I feel like it's, it's less structured, but it's probably more interesting for people to have this kind of question-driven approach. So this is the little mini tutorial I had on like machine learning for policies. Um, and basically, here's an example of um, a study. Oops, OK. I'm wondering if I should actually just jump into this. OK, how about this? Um, let's, uh, let's get back to that in a second. But how about especially people like who, are, who is interested in machine learning and reinforcement learning? OK, so how about I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sort of talk to you guys right now for about five, 10 minutes. I think I'll get back to there. So if you want to see how this fits into the broader scheme of my talk, this is basically part of the talk that's about machine learning for experimentation. And so I'm just going to a very high level. This is actually something I gave at um, the Learn Lab, Pittsburgh Science and Learning Center Summer School, I think, uh, a year ago. So the kind of key idea here is that um, how do we bring machine learning in to kind of take discover discover how to take personalized actions? There's lots of machine learning. How do you personalize? That's what recommended systems are often about. But how do we actually discover it? And so the problem, competition problem here is how do we use data to take actions and make recommendations? So to give you an example, um, here's a web page in an online course. How do we know which video to show people, which explanation to, to present them with? Um, if you've got a math problem, which hint do we give someone? Which motivational message do we present? Which email do we send? So I'm going to talk about kind of two ways of formulating this problem. One is called a multi arm bandit, and I'll talk about one algorithm that I've used for that. The other one and is Bayesian optimization or Galton process regression. I'm just going to talk for, for a couple of minutes. I don't have slides on it. And the application there is dynamically personalizing emails. So, OK, so let me introduce this formulation. Um, let's say you want to run a randomized experiment. And actually, I should make it concrete first. Let's say you want to run a randomized experiment. You give people a math problem. And then you want to give them an explanation for, you give them a math problem, and then they attempt it, they get told the answer. And you want to give them an explanation for why that answer is correct. What's the good explanation to give them? So then you might say, well, let's try an explanation that Min wrote. Let's try one that Bob wrote. Let's come up with an explanation that's based on cognitive theories about how simple explanations uh, help people generalize more because they identify line principles. So you could then present people with explanations, then ask them to rate, well, how helpful was this explanation? So you get some data. You could also look at whether the explanation they get A, B, or C actually helps learning on a subsequent test. And so this is what I see as a MOOClet. That's basically the component that I would set up so that you can do experimentation or personalization or a combination of both. So now, how do we model that problem? Where I was basically saying, let's take an action, give an explanation, and let's try and optimize something, which is a dependent variable like people's ratings of the explanation or the accuracy and feature problems. So here's how it's done in, in reinforcement learning. So a multi arm bandit. It's called that because in Las Vegas, um, they call a soft machine a bandit because it takes your money. And so you can think of having multi -arm, multiple arms. So do you call slot machine arm one, two, or three? Which of these is actually going to give you a good payoff? In the same way, when you give an explanation, which of them is going to have a high rating? So you formalize this problem as basically saying you have a set of actions, which are the explanations, let's say. There's a reward function you want to optimize. In this case, it could be rating of explanation, or it could be accuracy on a future problem. And so the problem you're facing here is you want to actually a policy, which is a way of saying, at any point in time, which action do I take? Which explanation do I sign in order to maximize my reward? And you often try to maximize reward over a horizon. Are you thinking about maximizing the, the learning gains for 1,000 students or 200? Or do you want to maximize any limit? Eventually, you want to discover what's the best explanation to give. And so multi bandits are basically a way of addressing this problem. They essentially say, Here's, um, it, sorry, multi arm bandits are a formulation of this problem. And so there are many algorithms for saying, how do we trade off exploring, like testing out actions or giving explanations, experimenting, with exploiting? Saying, well, I've got some evidence so far that five people rated this explanation highly, seven people rated this one or seven. Well, maybe we should give more people that. So that's basically the computational formulation of this, what's called exploration, testing out, versus exploitation. 
using what you know to give everyone the best. So there's also what's called a contextual bandit. Because what's the big flaw in this way of thinking about the world? If you want to optimize people's learning, isn't there something wrong with assuming that there's just one best option for everyone? And so this can be formed as what's called a contextual bandit. And so the idea is that you include some context. So in this case, context would be some vector of information. So it might be what problems the student has done before, their grade on a previous course, their language capacity. And you might think, well, maybe some actions work well for different groups of people. Maybe some explanations work well for people with high reading ability and others better people with low. And so the contextual bounded formulation is a lot more complex here in the sense of you're trying to take actions, but the reward is not just a function of which action you take. It's actually a function of the context and also which action you've taken. And so your policy now has to map a context vector and an action to a reward. So is anyone here wondering, well, how does this relate to kind of classical reinforcement learning like markup decision processes or POM DPs? So classic reinforcement learning, um, and bandits are really just a subset of reinforcement learning where there's no state or where the state is fixed. But classic reinforcement learning says there's some states that I'm in. And so in this case, you might think of, well, actually, a student is really not just a fixed fact. It's actually a state. Like someone can be in a, a, a motivated state or an unmotivated, or they can know something or not. And so this, this formulation says, well, given the state of the student, if I'm going to take repeated actions on them, I'm going to present the same student with different problems or different prompts or different motivation messages. How do I maximize the reward kind of that you learning gains by moving them through different states? Like maybe actually the best way to maximize learning is to move someone from being unmotivated to motivated. Or maybe that's not it. Maybe it's to move them from knowing this key fact, um, not knowing this key fact to knowing it, because then it helps them in future learning situations. And so basically now the, the reward function is a combination of states crossed with different actions. And now you have to think about transition probabilities where every time you take an action when someone's in a particular state, it gives you a reward, but it also moves them you to a future state from which you might get more or less rewards. That's kind of the thing you have to figure out. So basically, these are different ways of thinking about how to formulate this exploration, testing out ideas with exploitation, using data you have to do the best for everyone. OK, so what are algorithms you use for this? One simple one is epsilon greedy. So the idea here is that you could just say, I'm going to be totally uniform random. I'm just going to choose actions with equal probability. That's what we do in psychology experiments. You could say, I'm going to be greedy. I, took, I, I gave an explanation to Bob, and he liked it. Well, now I'm going to give that explanation to everyone. Epsilon greedy basically says, choose the action that's had the highest reward. So choose the explanation that has the highest rating so far. But epsilon of the time, 20% of the time, if epsilon is 20, just choose another action at random. So that's kind of one simple algorithm where you're taking actions that are optimal in the sense that they look good, you're being greedy, but every now and then you randomize. That, there are all kinds of reasons epsilon greedy um, isn't always effective. Another idea is upper confidence bound, where basically you say, estimate the mean of the reward of your action. Estimate the mean explanation rating. And then add some kind of confidence bound to that, where you say, well, I know the mean's 8, but it's only 10 students. And the mean of this one is 8.2, but there are three students. So I should add a confidence bound that says, well, I don't know much about that, so it could be really good. And this is a deterministic algorithm, where you just always take the item with the highest confidence bound. So the kinds of algorithms that I use a lot, um, because I find them more interpretable, and they often perform better in applications, is what's called Thompson sampling. And this is typically a Bayesian algorithm. And the key idea here is it's randomized. So the probability of choosing an action, the probability of assigning someone to an explanation, is the probability that that's the best action based on the data you have so far. So for example, if you know nothing at all, like you've got two explanations, you just present 50-50. Because the probability one is better than the other, there's no difference. But let's say you've actually assigned explanations to 50 people. And so for 25 of them, there's a rating of 6.5. And for the other 25, there's a rating of 7.1. So it looks like there might be a difference, but you, there's not actually that strong evidence. It could have been noise. So for Thompson sampling, you probably get something like, OK, assign 35. There's a 35% chance you assign people to the 51st person. There's a 35% chance they get assigned to explanation 1 with a 6.5 mean. And there's a 65% chance they get assigned to explanation 2 with a, a 7.1 mean. And so the key thing about Thompson sampling is that you're constantly updating a weighted probability distribution. So you're kind of constantly experimenting, and you're always randomizing, but you're weighting the, ran the, the probability of randomization 
based on the evidence that those are the best. Okay. Actually, let me jump into my presentation, actually, because I think those slides are nicer. <laughs> actually, any questions so far on what I covered? <coughs> OK, so how, how would we actually apply that in a useful way? Oops. OK. So. Here's a setting where I actually try to apply these algorithms for dynamically weighted randomization, where I'm trying to balance this exploring and exploiting. So the problem I want to tackle from a teacher's point of view is we've got all these problems, but students don't always learn key concepts. Often they just attempt the problems over and over without getting the idea. Well, one thing that's been shown from research and educational psych is giving good explanations that are really targeted online principle can help people see how to generalize. They're not just plugging numbers in algebra, but they understand that there are these principles for combining different simultaneous equations. But instructors don't really have time to write explanations often. If you look at a lot of MOOCs, there's nothing. So how are we going to convince instructors to write multiple explanations and then run experiments on them? Any ideas? Some people here are a lot better at persuading or querying instructors than I am. So one idea. Will students do that on their own to help each other? Well, so that's an interesting idea. Could you actually get students to do it? And how do you get that? Do you get them to do it because they're nice? Do you get them to do it because they like demonstrating knowledge? These are actually effective techniques that have been used in discussion forums. The approach that I took here is something I've developed with a collaborator at, a, at KAIS, Chu Ho Kim, and it's really this idea of learner sourcing. So we want to crowdsource some students. But let's actually crowdsource from learners. And the kind of key idea is we want them to contribute content, not because they're trying to be nice, but because it actually helps them. And so in, in my dissertation, what I looked at was, um, sorry, now I'm already jumping around, but OK. OK. In my decision, what I looked at was how prompting people to reflect could actually help them learn. And so this is kind of intuitive that. You know, if you prompt someone to explain their thinking, it can actually help them understand something better. You probably all had this happen. But what I investigated was, well, why exactly does prompting somebody explain help? And under what conditions is that just wasting their time? And so in this line of research, what I did was look at something like statistics problems. And I compared prompting people to explain why an answer was correct with actually having them write their thoughts. And even though these Prompts look really comparable. They both involve articulating language. They both involve spending time. Explaining why actually led to significantly better learning. And so the kind of key idea here is that if you look at accuracy, so people are solving problems, and they're being told, explain why your answer is correct, versus write your thoughts about this answer. If you look at um, pre to post tests, so in the pre test we give them similar problems. Then they get problems where they either explain or write their thoughts. And in the post test, they get new problems. And we try and measure from pre to post how much better they get at solving. Explaining why results in significantly better learning. And the key reason is that explaining why forces people to find online principles. And so that was the kind of key theory I came up with in my dissertation. When you ask why, like why an answer is correct, you're not just memorizing it or adding some random thoughts. You're actually being forced to say, how is this answer an instance of a general principle? And so using that then, what I came up with is in the context of actually students solving problems, we can then say to students, well, why don't you explain why this answer is correct? Because it's going to help you learn if you articulate it. And so now what you have is a method for continually adding new conditions. The prompt students to explain why an answer is correct. They write the explanation, and that gives you another condition which you can then test out. But what's your problem with that? Well, those explanations may not be very good at all. And so this is where it would be really valuable to think of, do we have to have an instructor go through them by hand and filter them? Or could we actually have a dynamic method where we could actually empirically experiment with explanations, see which ones are helpful to students, and then roll these out in real time? And so that's where dynamic adaptation comes in. 
So the key experimental procedure here is that learners come in and they see a problem. They attempt it and eventually they get told the correct answer. Either they type it in on the right or they just give up and get told. Then they get an explanation for why the answer is correct. And this comes from a pool of current explanations. They then ask to rate how helpful was the above information for your learning. On a scale from zero, completely unhelpful, to 10 perfectly. Then we actually tell them to help you learn. Explain your own words why the answer is correct. This explanation, if it's longer than 50 characters, and they say they will be useful to someone else, we add it to our pool. So it's a basic setup for learners. And so now, how do we actually run this kind of dynamic experiment where we figure out which explanations learners find helpful or not? And this will tie back into basically the multi unbounded framework that I mentioned. The kind of key idea is we formulate the dynamic experiment as a multi unbounded You have a set of actions you want to take, explanations you give someone, and you're trying to optimize a reward. In this case, the reward is going to be people's rating of how helpful it was. I did also look at data to try and optimize for people's accuracy on the next problem correct, but that actually wasn't as good a reward because it's very noisy and it depends on many things besides the explanation, like prior knowledge. But I will get back to learning games later. So now we need a policy. At a given point in time, which explanation do you give to people? And the policy here is a randomized probability matching algorithm, terms of sampling, where the key idea is that the probability of assigning people to conditions is the probability that that's the best explanation, highest rated explanation based on data so far. To know what's highest rated, we actually need a model of explanations. In this case, these, the parameters model, I model it as a beta binomial. So the kind of key idea here is that um, the, and this is, if you don't care about technical details, you can jump off on the next slide. But the kind of key idea is that the probability of an explanation being rated as helpful follows a beta distribution. So beta distribution is on the interval 0, 1. And it gives you some estimate of how likely is it that this explanation is, help, is helpful. But it's a distribution over probabilities. So to be concrete, if you've got a flat beta distribution, it's uniform. Well, I don't know if the probability of being helpful is 0. 0.2 or 0. 0.4, 0. 0.6. I have no idea. Whereas if you go to beta distribution that's peaked, for example, if you have a beta with parameters 19 and 1, that's essentially very peaked right around 95%, which makes you think, well, I think the probability this is helpful is really high. And so that's our prior distribution. And the particular parameters we used here were beta with 19 and 1. And that essentially means that before we saw any data, it's as if we thought that there had been one rating of an expression that was a 9 and one rating that was a 10. So we, we were very confident, we, sorry, we believed that it was good, you know, 9.5 out of 10. But actually, we weren't very sure. We just had two observations. Now, every time someone gives a rating of an explanation, we assume that follows a binomial distribution, where there are 10 samples, because they're at 0 out of 10. And the probability of success in this binomial is the probability of the explanation being rated helpful. So, Using Bayesian inference, we kind of keep updating the beta distribution. And the kind of key idea here is that at the beginning, you might think every explanation has been rated 9 or 10. But then when someone rates explanation 1 or 6, it's as if they give it 6 thumbs ups and 4 thumbs down. So now you kind of have, well, I have a 9, a 10, and a 6. If someone gives it an 8, then it's as if they give 8 thumbs up and 2 thumbs down. So now I have a 10, a 9, a 10, a 9, a 6, and an 8. So what you essentially get is you're able to sort of model over time um, what you think the average rating is and how sure you are in that. And so we use Bayesian inference this on the fly. And this particular choice of model, you know, you can argue with, and I think there are other alternatives that might be more interesting. Mm -hmm. What I'm looking at right now is actually just using normal distributions, um, normal inverse gamma, because that's a conjugate distribution. And the key reason is that that's going to correspond more closely to classical things like t-tests. But this worked well in this application. And so what you essentially, what we did is we deployed the system. I call it Access for Adaptive Explanation Improvement System with about 150 people. And so what happens is that first, there are no explanations at all. People are just seeing problems. They're being prompted to explain. But over time, explanations get added to the pool. And eventually, when you've got multiple explanations, the algorithm is updating based on people's rating of what's helpful. And so you start to get something that's evolving dynamically. So what you get at the end, you get a probability distribution over explanations. What does that look like? 
So a teacher might expect something like this. Oh, there's one best, and let's run with that. In fact, that's not really computationally efficient. And I think one of the reasons this works well with so little data is because instead you get something like this. There are a bunch of explanations that all look like they could be good, and there's some that are kind of clearly bad. So what's actually being served up to people is this probabilistic mixture of explanations. So in this kind of deployment, um, it looks like we have a system that can get high rates of explanations. But does this actually help learning? Or are people subjective to judgments just leading us astray? So to evaluate that, I did a separate experiment. And this setting, what we want to do is, is do a pre-post test. So people get a bunch of problems in geometry and algebra. Then they'd actually get practice problems, where they'd solve it, they get the answer. And they wouldn't get anything else. These, this is how a lot of MOOC problems are. There aren't really any explanations or hints. Or they get the problems with access explanations. So remember, we ran access with 150 people and got explanations. Now, with a different sample of people, we're actually going to have them solve problems without any explanations, or solve problems with the explanations from access. Now, if we found an effect, you'd also want to rule out some alternative interpretations. We also gave people problems with explanations that were filtered out by access, so they got really low probability. And finally, as a gold standard, we gave people problems with explanations written by the actual instructor. And so what's the impact of these access explanations on learning? This shows accuracy increase from pretest to post-test. So before you got the problems, um, you got a pretest and you get feedback, then you got the problems with answers and explanations, and then you got a post-test. So how much they actually increase in their ability to solve new problems? You can see that there's actually a significant advantage to learning from access explanations, even though these were crowdsourced from learners. Once they run through this dynamic process, we're actually getting explanations that do seem to improve learning. If you were skeptical, though, you'd say, well, of course it helps. It's an explanation versus nothing. Any explanation would help. Actually, explanations that were filtered out by access that were given low probability of assignment because they weren't highly rated don't help learning. It's, it's like getting no explanation at all. So how good would these access explanations have to be compared to an instructor for you to think this was a useful system? What do you guys think? 10%, 40%? It just depends on how busy the instructor is and how motivated the instructor is to contribute in to that. Way. So, so that's a good point that these trade offs, right? Yeah. And I think students' explanations are probably better than the instructors just mm -hmm. because they have the context of this. So, actually, maybe even student explanations are better. So, in this application, at least, we didn't find there was a significant difference. Mm -hmm. Explanations from this process, crowdsourcing, run through dynamic experiments, help learning just as much as explanations from a real instructor. Now, in other contexts, instructors might actually be better if instructors come with explanations that are tailored to students' misconceptions, where students won't pick it up. But in other contexts, and this is a great direction for future research, students might actually produce better explanations because they're more familiar with the context of what they do and don't understand. So I think that's a great direction for future work. When we showed the explanations to the instructor, they actually found that they were comparable. They admitted that they did actually prefer this but that they couldn't really think of an argument for giving theirs over the others, and they want to actually see a test and experiment. <laughs> Great. So the kind of key contributions of this work, this project on access, are how do we crowdsource some self-interested contributors, in particular learner sourcing? And here's how we can use dynamic experiments to actually put data into practice and make a, a real-time improvement. But you know, there are many um, future directions and limitations in this work. How can we actually incorporate teachers in the loop so the only data we used here to optimize was actually students' ratings of explanations. But could we actually let teachers give a rating as well? So it's not that the teacher has to decide, get rid of this or keep this. But they could actually say, I think this is x percent better than that one. And that could be input to the algorithm. That could be part of the reward function we're optimizing. Another idea is actually using methods like natural language processing, and Lynn knows much more about this than I do, to provide metrics of explanation quality. So again, I, I always lean towards things that are sort of soft constraints rather than hard. It's not that we're going to discard or keep explanations based on a metric like um, reading quality or reading level or, or sort of phrase complexity, but this could be another bit of data to the reward function. So we can combine student rating with instructor rating with NLP metrics. 
And I, I'm especially interested in pushing this to uh, some sort of broader context. So for example, if you think of forums to community question answering, what if you have a student studying a video and they ask, well, what's the key assumption in IE days? And they write the answer. Well, that actually, do you see how that's kind of similar to this access approach? They're just answering questions because it's helping them reflect. But we can actually then have a pair. We have a question answer pair that could then go into a discussion forum. So in a discussion forum, you could then imagine, well, maybe the answers to questions are actually coming from students. And then we need to start thinking about how do we actually dynamically evaluate those. And so one thing I worked on recently is a paper published in Rexis, where we use recommender systems to recommend different questions that we should have people answer. But that again involved figuring out how do we route questions to the right people. I think this is really exciting because we could take people's organic activities again, they're learning and reflecting, and then figure out how do we actually serve up different questions that will help them reflect and learn, but also help them kind of do work for other people, ask the questions that maybe we haven't got a good answer for yet. And so there are really nice connections between um, dynamic experiments or multi bandits and recommended systems. Um, just to, sorry, on the side, who here is the firm with the recommender system? Okay. But just so the basic idea is a recommender system is what Netflix uses to give you movies. It's essentially saying, for a given user, like you have a vector information, what do they probably want right now? And so there are all kinds of methods for sort of figuring out how do you personalize different users, their methods of trying to think of which users are similar or not. But that, it's kind of a nice um, framework for sort of bringing these things into applications, and there's a ton of research on that. There's a whole conference, ACM Rexis. Going back to your yeah. process, I just had a question. You, you said your experimentation was with n equals 150. Were they the yes. same 150 for, for all the problems? Yeah, so basically what happened is someone would come in and they would get four problems. So they get geometry, algebra, and so on. And then the next person would come in and they get those problems again. So it's essentially like a within subjects experiment. We can treat them a bit independently. Okay. How much contributions for each one of the students? You mean how many of it? Yeah. So what's interesting is I would say I have to check the data, but only about 40% of people give an explanation. They just ignore us. 40%. 40%. So a lot of them just ignore us. How many months? How many months? Um, so it's 150 students. So every student has one opportunity to give an explanation. Mm -hmm. And I would say 40% of them write anything at all. But actually, when you think of how many explanations we end up with at the end of that 150, it's only between 10 and 18. So one important thing we did is we had we sort of, and this is where the kind of user-centered design co comes in. We had people opt in to share the explanation. So it wouldn't be shared unless they like ticked a box saying, oh yeah, this would be good. And what's good about that is that it meant that we didn't get a lot of very random explanations or ones that weren't carefully thought out. And so a kind of key idea here is that, especially when you look at crowdsourcing literature and human computer interaction, you don't have to use everything. In fact, you can afford to lose a lot of good content. There are probably people who didn't check the box but gave perfectly good explanations. That's okay for us computationally because our job is not to figure out that everyone's explanation, figure out the quality of everyone's explanation. Our job is just to find some good ones that are going to help people learn. You know, so in your data, um, are you separating those you know, for the pre and post for accuracy? Are you separating those that actually contribute explanation versus those who are ignored? You mean, so for example, um, is contributing estimation helping people learn? Yeah. yeah, so these are two separate studies, so we don't have those pre process measures. So I didn't measure in this context. But there is lots of evidence in other settings, like you know, I've run experiments showing that prompt people explain compared to no, no prompt or prompting the right thoughts can't help learning. That's the kind of earlier study I mentioned. So I, I, would, I would suppose that that is helping them learn. And at least they report that they find it helpful. So they say it's an effort, but I'm really glad I wrote this out. I hope I can, I, I might apply this in other strategies besides math. Okay. Um, have, you, have you considered or tried an approach to evaluating uh, explanations like, say, what Quora does, where you have basically upvoting, which I guess is okay. pretty standard. So yes. Yes. Yeah, so I think um, in our setting, I, I find upvoting and downvoting doesn't always give so much information. So in my setting, what I did is I presented them with an explanation. I had them kind of rate how helpful it was. So I'm just giving zero to 10. So maybe that's one difference is that we're trying to get a continuous measure. Um, the, other, the other difference maybe is that when you kind of upvote to downvote, it's not always clear to me what tasks you engage in on Quora. You know, are you just sort of happen to see it randomly and you say, okay, I'll put a vote? 
is it that you really care about the topic? So maybe one dis distinction here is that because we're embedding this in a learning task, we're actually getting people to explain at the moment that they've just read the explanation. Um, yeah, so they're, they're, they actually just solve the problem, so they've got the context. Then they give an explanation, and they ask you how helpful it was. So you know, maybe one reason I think we may get um, more insightful information is that they've actually got the proper context. And another interesting observation is the instructor who worked with us said, you know, I actually like this question because I bet a lot of people don't even read that explanation otherwise. So again, it's a very light touch. They don't have to read it. A lot of people just ignore it. But I'm again trying to think of what are things we do that are helping learners, but also kind of helping the system or community. Was this a control assignment, or is it deployed in the real world? Yeah, so it, that's a good argument. It's arguable which one it is. So we actually deployed this to online crowd workers. So people deployed on Mechanical too. Mm -hmm. So you know, they're not controls to allow participants, mm -hmm. but they are you know, at least a convenient sample. Yeah. And so we are running some of the things now in a MOOC, mm -hmm. where it's actually a calculus course. that I, I was able to do some guest lectures and still allowed me to plug the system in, and we kind of see how it helps there. And we have actually run, I haven't run this exact system, but we have run in some Harvard courses, um, studies where we prompt people to explain or not. And you get similar kinds of effects where, um, you know, a certain proportion of people ignore it. Some people do explain, it can benefit them. Yeah. So I'm thinking, well, what can we get to cover? Yeah, I hope you guys don't mind the free flowing element. I just thought it might be more engaging um, versus like a, a typical kind of colloquium talk. So to kind of check in, so we're thinking about this vision of perpetually improving systems. And I kind of highlighted you know, one aspect, collaborative dynamic experimentation. In the context of the collaboration is like crowdsourcing from learners, and the dynamic experimentation is figuring out which explanations have been rated highly and rolling that data out. So in terms of other things to touch on, um, I mean, we should even take votes. So. How many people, just put up your hand, would be interested in hearing a bit about two experiments on motivation reflection where it was psychologists combined, collaborating with instructional designers on Khan Academy and um, another setting? OK. Oh, OK. Um, OK, cool. Well, you guys have, I, I'm more excited about the dynamic stuff, but, but that's good to know as audience feedback. <laughs> um, you, I talked about this. So this is a system CD problem, which basically you can plug into Canvas to Harvard's learning management system, and now I'm plugging into Ivy League, and it lets instructors co-design experiments with researchers um, on feedback messages or explanations. So who's interested in that? OK. Um, one simple illustration of discovering how to personalize. So there's a motivational email study where I send out emails to people trying to kind of get them to see why they dropped out, and we dynamically figured out which emails work for different age groups. So who's interested in that? Is it that people aren't interested or, or energy is flagging? <laughs> <laughs> Whose energy is flagging? OK. All right, then there's a um, discussion of the Mooclet engine and API. So this is basically just saying a bit more about how that's structured and how it, um, why it enables dynamic experimentation. OK. Would that be actually like a visualization of the actual tool itself? So if I was a teacher who wanted to use this, like what would I get? And it's more the concepts. Because it's basically a back end for building tools. Yeah. OK, and how about resource experiments like Qualtrics, Assistance, Mechanical Turk? OK. And then ongoing and next directions, like criticizing motivational emails, delivery of growth mindset interventions, web app for students to set micro goals, reflective question strategies. Who's interested in that? OK. All right, so maybe um, I think 19 minutes is way too long to go without a break. So maybe I can cover the motivation experiment in a couple minutes. And then we can take a five minute break and then wrap up by one, and then come back and wrap up by one. Does that sound good? OK. OK, great. OK, so what, what I'm going to talk about now is, is two kinds of experiments and math problems that kind of arose out of me as a researcher collaborating with Rebel platforms. So one was adding motivation messages. So again, in this paradigm of math problems, how might you add small nudges that would actually encourage people to work harder? 
And the other one I've already discussed, you know, how will we think about different prompts to reflect and how we bring psychological views to bear in figuring out which prompts are effective. And this was funded by um, an NSF grant that I was a co cool PI on with Neil Heffernan about bringing experiments from the lab into real world settings. So this is the first time I, I ran an experiment in an online environment. Um, and it was in collaboration with Khan Academy because when I was at Berkeley at the time, we didn't have an online education platform that was easy to use. Once I moved to like MOOC offices, it was a lot uh, more straightforward. And here at NUS, we have huge opportunities. So the setting for Khan Academy is basically they've got these platforms everyone's doing. You see a problem, you attempt it, you can ask for hints or not. But when I go to them, the key question they always had is, what's the simplest thing you can do, technically, that doesn't involve changing infrastructure that's actually going to have benefit learners? And so here's where, actually, I, I um, drew on collaborating with some people from Carol Dweck's group at Stanford on growth mindset. So the theory behind growth mindset is that many people may believe intelligence is fixed in the sense of the absurd amount it doesn't really change. This a growth mindset is the idea that intelligence is a malleable quantity. When you work harder, you can get smarter. When you choose better strategies, you're actually getting more intelligent. And so there's a lot of work showing that there's correlations between fixed and growth mindset. And, but only in the last four or five years have people tried to randomize interventions that actually change people's mindset. Well, these are at a large scale. And so the key idea here was we tried to make a small nudge, just adding a message about problems to see if this would actually have an effect on people's behavior. So we added growth mindset messages, like, remember, the more you practice, the smarter you become. And so the experiment was ideally in the growth mindset condition. So for about 50 problems, you get growth mindset messages, and we add 12 different kinds, or even practice as usual. So just what happens normally, no messages at all. And so what you want to see is, does this actually make people attempt more problems? But we also included a control condition. If we found an effective growth mindset, it's hard to say if it's just showing a message at all. And so we include this encouraging message condition. Some of these problems are hard, do your best. So what's interesting is it's positive, but it's actually not encouraging people to believe that they get smarter through effort. So it's actually quite a closely matched control. And you don't actually, you, I haven't seen this in other studies that have tried to look at the effects of growth mindset. Is it going above and beyond positive messaging? As so it was with about 200,000 people, but it's very different when you're in this kind of online context. It raises a field context. Some of those people could be you. If you went to Khan Academy you you know, four years ago, you could have landed in our experiment, even though you're just there to see what the website's about. So there's a huge variation. So what's the effect of these messages? So a growth mindset message actually led to a 1% increase in how many problems people attempted, compared to no message at all. So it's a really small effect, just 1%. But I think the thing to remember here is that when we do lab studies, essentially we've stacked the deck. Everyone's actually reading these messages. They're doing what we want. When you do a field experiment, we don't actually know who read this message. And if you think of the average high school or middle school student, how many of them you think even read those kind of messages that are popping up? So this is an intent to treat analysis. So I was still actually surprised there was any effect at all. And it's actually really easy to incorporate. But how does this compare to the encouraging message? So you might think, well, of course, I this message help. And you might also think, well, with 200,000 people, anything's significant, right? In fact, there's no significant difference between practice usual and encouraging message. So encouraging message is like showing nothing at all. So not anything is significant with enough people. And this is a pretty modest experiment. And you'd have to wonder, well, what is the practical implication of this? You know, you could make the argument, well, just from efficiency, it's such a small change, it can have a big effect. And it's sort of a good cost-benefit trade-off. But there was actually a very unanticipated benefit that I realized. Because of the internal discussion that's generated in Khan Academy, learning about growth mindset, seeing it done in their platform with their materials, even though I found, and I think many of you find the effects pretty modest, they then decided that they would launch a You Can Learn Anything campaign. So it's independent of us. They said, well, let's send videos and emails to 11 million learners. Really encouraging them to believe, if you try hard, you can learn anything. And so they added videos with interviews with Carol Dweck and talking about growth mindset. So just one illustration of how experiments that we think are kind of small uh, might actually lead to big real impact if we actually do them in the context. And they then also led a competition inviting researchers to submit similar experiments. And this is something I think I'm especially excited about, um, maybe here at NUS other places, which is there are competitions for data mining. John talked about one this morning. But what if we have competitions where people can submit ideas for improving lessons? ideas for building motivation interventions. And the way we evaluate them 
is actually by randomizing them against each other. So in the same way when we were crowdsourcing explanations from students with access, they were essentially competing, but the metric evaluation was a randomized experiment on learning gains. How do we actually structure this kind of workflow so that we can invite researchers and teachers to propose different conditions that we can actually pit against each other? I think another really nice angle on that is um, Min mentioned how instructors feel when we're doing these activities in their classes. One kind of key theme, I think, is involving instructors in this process. So the word experimentation has a lot of negative connotations. People think of shocking rats, they think of guinea pigs. But when you help an instructor see, you've got problems, like math problems, you've got lessons, and you want to know what question do I ask students to help improve it. That's an entirely different um, scheme. Then they're actually really interested in saying, well, here are my ideas. Let's test these against yours. And they're very happy for people to actually come and help add content to improve their courses. That's kind of key takeaway from that study. And maybe just to kind of continue that thread of what I said about instructors and explanations. And then like five minutes more, then you can take a break. And be liberated. <laughs> this is a tool that I designed for co-designing experiments. So the kind of key idea here is let's again use experiments as a bridge between instructors who want to improve instruction and social behavioral scientists who want to test hypotheses about learning. And so this is a tool I built for Canvas and deployed in three Harvard courses, but I've actually tested on Ivy League, it kind of gets in, and we want to make some improvements. But the kind of key idea here is that we want to help an instructor, a researcher, in this case, I have to do a search, I have a conversation about an experiment in the context of specific materials. And the other is we want to trade off something. The instructor only cares about experimentation to the extent to which it's going to enhance learning. So they essentially, if you think about it from machine learning, they're on the exploitation. If I know something, let's give it to everyone. A scientist is very much on exploration. They want to randomize uniformly because that's standard practice and needs to maximize the power. So how do we trade off these tensions between instructors who want to put something into practice and scientists who want to discover what's happening or even just test some hypothesis about learning? And so I think this dynamic analysis is actually very promising for this, where we can actually think about using algorithms from bandits to sort of trade off testing out what's working with actually using that data to make improvements. And there's a lot of related work in um, the clinical literature on adaptive clinical trials. There'll actually be a talk on Friday by B Bibas Chakraborty on, on a different kind of methodology that's related in the medical field. So if you actually want to use this right now in your course, you could actually go to this URL, tiny.cc CD site. CD is for collaborative dynamic experimentation. You can actually see the app and, and plug it into your course via learning tools interoperability, or LTI. That's a standard for getting different software to work inside of other things like courses, um, MOOCs, et cetera. But the kind of key idea here is that instructors, when a student goes into the, into the setting, all they really see is just a problem. Solve that, choose an answer. And then they might get some feedback. But where does that feedback come from? The instructor, actually, when they go to the course, sees an interface where they can actually edit different conditions. So they can design an experiment and conduct this. And actually, there isn't a tool for doing this right now in Canvas. In Ivy I don't think there's one either. Most systems just don't build tools for experimentation. So here's an example of one study where we just left the instructor's feedback, where we added feedback plus a prompt to review. If you want to review this kind of question further, look back about your notes or click on the link to see the relevant video. And so at first, we actually looked at, um, again, students' ratings. So what's their rating of feedback? And that's what we did in the first round of the study. And the instructor was interested in that. They sort of found they got some useful data about what students found helpful or didn't. In particular, I actually had the instructor make predictions. They said that they thought the feedback alone would be 7 out of 10, and feedback in the prompt would be 8 out of 10. In fact, there was no difference. And one kind of key insight here is that just the act of involving instructors in designing experiments could actually help them reflect on their pedagogy. But what is useful here is that once we had done that first experiment using this quick to collect subjective measure, they were then actually interested in measuring learning. So the follow-up experiment, they actually embedded inside of a problem that was followed by many other problems testing a similar concept. So then we could actually start collecting learning gains. And so in this case, you can see we actually get some accuracy uh, data about Depending on which message they got, there, there may be a trend towards differences in accuracy in the next problem. And this is something we need to collect more data on. But one thing you might notice here is that the probability of being assigned to condition is being adjusted. So we're asking students to rate explanations or feedback messages. And based on that, we're actually ruling it out in real time. So this is really 
of interest to instructors because then they can actually see how the experiment wasn't just for me to discover some fact about learning or test some hypotheses. It was actually making differences to their students. So they felt that this kind of tool lowered by its instruction. I don't know any other way I would do this. I never really considered typing a multiple versions like we're doing now. Even if we don't get any significant data, that would have been a benefit in my mind. It also made research practical. I know you know lots of general things about how students learn, but I know specific things about how they get calculus. And so being able to bring those together was useful. And they really liked it directly help students. The earlier students can help improve the experience of the later students. That's actually done. It seems more ethical or fair. Great. Cool. So just kind of sum up what we covered so far, which actually has finally mapped the course, <laughs> the talk. I just kind of started this vision of perpetually improving systems. How do we kind of get towards that? And the approach I outlined here was thinking about collaborative, dynamic, and personalized experimentation. I talked about one study in the context of Khan Academy where we did an experiment on motivation. Another study in the context of learning statistics where we, where we tested how prompt people to explain why help learning. Then I showed how that led to a system, the adaptive explanation improvement system, that crowdsourced explanations on learners and dynamically tested which ones people found helpful. And this actually produced explanations that help learning as much as a real instructor. I then outlined how this could actually segue into building systems that let instructors conduct experiments themselves or conduct in collaboration with researchers where they can test out feedback messages or ideas that, that they find useful, but also by using dynamic experiments, they might actually see it as bringing research to practice, more ethical experiments and a way to actually use data to improve what students are getting. And if we have time when we get back, I can discuss about um, how you use experiments to discover how to personalize. Actually, I, okay, just let me show you that. We send emails to people of different kinds. It looked like there was no difference at all. So you would just think, let's pack up and go home. But actually, once you break it up by different profiles, you realize that there's this interaction where one email is working better for low-activity people and another email for another set of people. And so in fact, you can then actually really boost responses by optimizing through personalizing. So you can use the experiment to discover what's working for people with different activity levels. And if you use that data, you can actually optimize without creating any more content, just figuring out how to deliver it more efficiently. Okay. And um, I can talk more about Mukla Engine API, which is basically back end for all of these deployments and resources of experiments, especially um, tools like Qualtrics, which I think instructors will be interested in because it helps them build things quickly and work with researchers. But Qualtrics is still sophisticated enough that you have APIs for machine learning, and researchers get some scientific grade data. Assessments is another platform like this where teachers find it really usable, like hundreds of them use it in the US, and it's actually been shown in an efficacy trial to help learning of students. But it's also got research grade data. You know, you've got randomized experimentation, you can get rich analytics, and the idea of using um, I resources on using mechanical turf that I can share. In terms of where I'm most excited about going next, it's really thinking about um, things like discovering how to personalize motivational emails. How do we actually think of these interventions like growth mindset, self explanation training that we can figure out how to combine and deliver, like to freshman students? And thinking about how do we take interventions and, and kind of bring them into settings that are more like web apps, where students themselves might set micro goals and they're more active participants in basically um, figuring out what's going to work for them. And finally, another web app I'm interested in is how do you help students use reflective question strategies? So, not just prompt them to explain, like in these earlier studies, but actually help them cultivate those habits themselves. All right, thanks so much. Any questions? Yeah? Uh, you, were, you were commenting on dynamic kind of engineering concepts. Yes. Um, you know, I can make the impression that uh, you know, everybody can use dynamic engineering skills. But in some scenario, two examples. So uh, two students, right? You dynamically giving me this question, I answered. And the US system assumed this person already understood it. So in the final test, if I pass this problem, because I was given this problem explicitly, the other one was not given. There's an issue that comes back and says, you know what? I I have an advantage of people given this information. Yeah. I have the highest current score. How can you make that uh, you know argument that the system is, is, is fair? Yeah. I cannot, this person say, well, this is not fair. 
I supposed to be given that information, and I did not get the information. If I fail, yeah, I think that's a really good point. So the question is, when you're dynamically changing things, people may argue that it's unfair. Why did I get a condition that was less good than someone else? Yeah. Do I, I've thought on it, but does anyone else have comments on that? Uh, I wish you were here for the last two days, but we have a, another workshop going on in parallel, which we did last day on AI and ethics and fairness. Okay, so yeah. That's, that's what, yeah. yeah, which we'll just touch exactly on that. Uh, so there are policy issues there also going on, um, and discussions about ethics and Any Any kind of uh, you know, tech message? Like, how, how there is an issue. What is the best solution? I, I think people are aware of the problem. I don't think they have a, a way to address it. I would say probably with, with something like Joseph's system, just being able to state that you know these problems are actually improving your overall uh, understanding and so the baseline performance that you have without any other personalization is being going up. Whether that means in, in a context where you're graded relative to other people, whether you know you, even though you get more out of the course, you actually end up with a lower grade, that's something Shouldn't the personalization take in effect, take into account people's outcome, not performance, so that um, so that it starts to look at some of these potential ones. Yeah, especially for the high state tests, right? You know, of course, you know, for other purposes, that's the kind of reaction, you know, come against your errors or their mistakes. But actually, due to you know the, the, the prior episode of learning. They can come back yeah, that, that happens a lot, uh, especially when you do any type of personalization in the course, like we have advanced learners and give them more difficult uh, questions. It could be that uh, you know you set up your uh, system such that anyone can go through any amount of material. It's just that the, the recommended system is giving you the optimal course given the time a lot the, uh, the most efficient use of your time that you want or any other conditions that, that are available in the course. Um, I, I think this is a really big issue here in Singapore because uh, many uh, of, of our school systems in Singapore follow some type of normal distribution for students. So even though uh, you know students put in more effort uh, and actually understand better, they, they're still relatively greater than this in the cohort. So they may end up you know, not, not gaining anything in terms of grade, you know, practice grade. So that's a, a, a big concern for us here because uh, some of us want to move to uh, more fine grain assessments for uh, tasks or ideas to get away from you know, this midterm exam or a final exam to go for holistic continuous assessment every week. But uh, if anyone who has children in Singapore will know, uh, you know, this type of uh, assessment you know, creates a lot of stress because basically every day you're studying for an exam, and if you miss an exam, that activity uh, drops. So that's a, that's a good one. I do see from uh, running a professional school that high stakes board exams. Sometimes a course is online, so you've got a high stakes board exam. So I think if we could bring in all these other sources of feedback, it could help uh, help the course itself um, tailor a little bit more directly to some of the high stakes exams that otherwise might not happen. You see that yeah. as well. Yeah, I, mean, I think these are all great points, and I'm not sure if we can give a resolution, but I think this fairness issue of what if people get different things, I think the problem is that we can't really. We can't really help people unless you're willing to. Well, I should say. It's um, so. What's the alternative to running these experiments? You know, what's the alternative? The alternative is you give everyone what you have right now, and that's kind of an experiment where you give everyone one condition and zero people get the other. So I think the alternative is we just do something by essentially shutting our eyes because we don't know what's better. And so you could think of that almost as saying, well, we've got students who are in school and we could help them by giving them this really good training program, but you know what? We can't give it to everyone, so let's give it to no one at all. And some people would argue for that. They would say, don't do an experiment because you can't give it to everyone, so just don't do it at all. On the other hand, that does seem unfair because then there are a lot of people who are missing out from a potentially better resource. One way in which maybe it is fair, a bit fairer, is that it is random who gets what. So it's kind of like a lottery, right? You get randomly assigned. So we're not saying that a student group is not getting this or not getting that. We're actually assigning people randomly. And we are trying to sort of match, basically, um, 
what we give people with how much evidence we have that it's useful. So maybe that's one sense in which it is, is a bit fairer. It's not that we have targets to you. It's more just that um, we're trying to figure out what's working best for you, and it's going to take some time to do that. And I think maybe the third argument um, that Bob kind of raises, you could say that we should give everyone one best thing. Or even if we run the experiment, as soon as you see an effect, great, give everyone A. And in fact, in clinical drug trials, they often do this. They just cut it because they say it's unethical to continue. That makes me really uncomfortable for two reasons. One is, if you just cut something off right away, you could be wrong. I don't think it's a coincidence that many, pharma many pharmaceutical companies love that idea. As soon as a drug is effective, it's unethical to keep continuing the experiment. Let's just stop it, and let's never experiment on that again, because we're so sure that's the best condition. So that kind of worries me, right? In a way, you should think experiments should never be all or nothing. It's not 50-50 or 0-100. You could actually think of your prior. How sure are you this is working? 10%? Then, OK, 10% of people go in their condition. And if you're right, great. We quickly converge to 0. But if you're wrong, you at least collect data so you figure that out. And I think the other element is also personalization. Even if something looks best on average, it's almost unfair to people to not keep experimenting because it could be that what's looking best on average is actually concealing the fact that it's not actually optimal for everyone. So for example, you know, let's pretend this was way bigger. This could be better on average, but it could actually be because it's fitting one group. So it could just be that there are more people of a certain group there, or there's some kind of artifact. So I think that's a really good argument for continually trying out different things, because it could be you discover over time, eventually, that it works well for different people. So I kind of, for me, the, the big insight here is that experimentation and personalization are really two sides of the same coin. You've got different versions, and you can assign them randomly. We can assign them based on a feature of a student. And so really, you can't really discover how best to kind of tailor uh, without at least conducting some experiments. Yeah. So I'm actually very interested in your experimental material. So you were mentioning that I can just call through to yes. the uh, um, small class and, and have their tools. Yes. Would you be able to share? Oh, yeah, that? for sure. And um, sorry, I was going to liberate you guys, but I guess we're almost any time. So basically, the MOOClet a specification, this is a concept. So it's basically saying, take a piece of your interface, an explanation, motivation, message, and you want to. It's a MOOClet, if and only if, you split it up into like versions, which have APIs, a policy, which could be random assignment or personalization or something like a band algorithm, and then there's a learner data store. So this is the kind of concept. We've actually instantiated that in an architecture. So if you go to GitHub, this is the first time we kind of essentially made a MOOClet class. It sort of shows, here's how you declare the right data structures. Here's how you actually um, articulate an experiment in a way that you can always get personalization. And in fact, we just have a web app. And there's APIs. So if you want to run an experiment, you could actually use MOOCless as a backend. So you could say, well, I have my front end system, like my website or my canvas, and I'm actually going to just make a call to the MOOCLE API to see which conditions get assigned to who. So you can actually use this code and test it out. Um, right now, I've used it mostly for sort of small courses. I think it could definitely um, be greatly enhanced with like, more software engineering input, which I'm, I'm very open to. But yeah, it's open on GitHub, and I can actually send you more information on how to use Qualtrics with it. And you, know, you could just rebuild all this from scratch. Like, I'm sure Google doesn't need this kind of thing. Microsoft doesn't, because they've got tons of people employed. But I've just tried to find tools like Qualtrics and, and this kind of app that basically integrates so that people can kind of quickly try things out. All right, I'll stick around for questions, but thanks so much for coming. Oh, yeah, sure. And also, I have tons of stuff on my website. So um, some people say my website looks like a Wikipedia page and it needs some design work, <laughs> which is probably reasonable. But it does mean that, like, you know, there's something on Mooklets here, the formalism as well as links to all different resources. There's um, this thing on basically recruiting people on Mechanical Turk. Um, there's a Quadrix wiki. And um, you know, in cases of interest also for people who are kind of interest in this kind of thing. I basically just tried to put together some articles on like different kind of education research that might be relevant. So.